Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for joining today's webinar titled Introduction to Circular Economy. My name is Maha Sheikh, and I am the Communications Specialist working at the Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab at Tufts University. As more attendees are joining the webinar, I will begin by briefly going over some of the logistical items. Next, please. I would like to direct all attendees to a few functions on this Zoom call. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Please use the chat feature to engage in relevant conversation with the other attendees and feel free to also introduce yourself. Next, please. If you have a question for our speakers, please use the Q&A feature. We have allotted 25 minutes of this webinar for Q&A. And if at any point you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please send a message in the chat to panelists so that our team can assist you. This webinar is being recorded and it will be made available on our website following the event. Next, please. I would now like to introduce Dr. Patrick Webb, who will be the moderator for today's session. Dr. Webb is the Alexander McFarlane Professor of Nutrition at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Until 2005, Dr. Webb was the Chief of Nutrition at the United Nations World Food Program in Rome. Today, he is the director of the Feed the Future Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab. He has served on numerous task forces and global advisory panels, including currently serving on the high-level panel of experts of the Committee on World Food Security. He is technical advisor to the Global Panel on Agriculture and Food Systems for Nutrition and serves as one of the commissioners for the ongoing Eat Lancet 2.0 study. Patrick, over to you. Well, thank you, Maha. And hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, first in a series of three uh, new seminars, uh, sorry, webinars, uh, that are the new iteration of webinars, uh, this time coming from the Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab, part of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab activities, which is the successor to what many of you knew as the Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, we're kicking off the, this new webinar series with a, a collaboration with Thriving Solutions. And it's a series of three interconnected um, webinars relating to the circular economy in, as it relates in particular to food. Now, the, you, this new Food Systems for Nutrition Innovation Lab uh, takes this issue very seriously, particularly in the context of food loss and waste, cutting food loss and waste, a very important dimension uh, relating both to sustainability and to making healthy diets available uh, to all. Uh, that is one of three primary foci of the new uh, innovation lab. The other two, uh, in addition to cutting food loss and waste, are improving uh, food safety for everyone and innovations along food value chains to make <clears throat> nutrient-rich foods, excuse me, uh, more accessible and affordable uh, to everyone who needs them. Our primary focus of the lab is South Asia and Southern Africa, but of course many of the issues, hopefully many of the results of applied research and new thinking will be able to apply uh, globally. So this lab, this uh, first webinar in this series, um, very much focused on uh, food in its relationship to circular economies. And we have two speakers. This webinar goes uh, for an hour and a quarter. Uh, we have two speakers, starting with Seta Dunjan, who is a very well-known advocate. We're very glad to, to have her and, her, and uh, Omar with us. Um, she's an advocate for sustainability and transitioning to circular and regenerative uh, economies, particularly in water-scarce re regions. Uh, and that, uh, that definition, water-scarce, is growing. Uh, and uh, water scarce often combines with food insecurity. Um, she uh, is very much engaged with mobilizing stakeholders around innovations and novel approaches to increase resilience, uh, build demand for better management of, of all dimensions of water, agriculture, and energy sectors, because those sectors uh, intersect uh, hugely. 
CETA uh, uh, co-leads the Global Food is Never Waste, Waste Coalition, which came out of the UN Food Systems Summit in 2021. And she's on the board of the uh, general board of United Cities. Um, and she's founder and CEO of Thriving Solutions, that's the, with whom we're collaborating for these three uh, webinars. And that's a sustainability consulting firm dedicated to decarbonization, safeguarding biodiversity, and regenerating nature. So Seta is going to uh, talk for about 25 minutes, then we'll uh, have some Q&A before handing over uh, for a shorter presentation from Omar Abush, and I'll introduce him just before that. So at this point, the floor, Seta, is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick, very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, to do, talk about a subject very dear to my heart, which is how can we uh, transform our current food system to be more uh, circular? So that starts, of course, with understanding what is circularity, what's the circular economy, what's the circular food economy. And our hope today is to give you a quick taste of what that is. So please, Maha, next, please. So to start with, let's look at what is our current economy. Our current economy is built on a linear module, with, uh, which assumes that material and resources are infinite. So we take resources from the uh, ecosystem. We produce the product we want to produce. While producing that product, we generate different streams of waste. And then the product itself, we use it, and then we dispose of it generating even more waste. And throughout this whole process, we are polluting the environment. So this linear operation module, basically it requires endless supplies of resources, be it natural resources, be it financial resources. And of course it increases waste, but it also accelerates pollution and also accelerates greenhouse gas emissions, which as we all know is an issue with uh, climate change. Next, please. So if we're looking, what are the implications of this linear economy on our Earth? So our current consumption and uh, waste disposal system basically requires a full Earth plus three-fourths of another Earth to meet our uh, consumption and waste uh, management uh, habits. And there is something that we call an Earth overshoot day which is the day that marks when we have exhausted all of the planetary resources for that year. And during 2022, that day fell on the 28th of July. But it's worth to mention that different countries have a different Earth overshoot day, and some countries exhaust their overshoot day during the first quarter of the year even. And as we see, if we see for the last 50 years, we can see that since 1971, this uh, we are increasingly requiring more and more of planet Earth resources to be able to sustain our production and consumption and waste disposal habits. Next, please. So as we all know, waste is a global problem, but what's, what are the dimensions of this problem? So in 2020, we generated around 2.24 billion tons of solid waste alone. And by 2050, if we continue with our current module, we will be generating 3.88 billion tons of solid waste. And already I'm sure most of you have passed by a landfill and have observed the magnitude of the waste problem. On an average person uh, waste, the daily footprint of uh, people is basically of every person is around 0.79 kilograms. Of course, that differs between countries, developed countries, uh, the inhabitants have much higher uh, daily footprint than people uh, living in developing countries in some developing countries. But on an average, each person produce a little bit less than one kilogram of waste every single day. And a lot of that waste that ends in landfills particularly in the global south, like we're talking about 90% of that waste is unregulated with much of that waste being burned, exhuming, of course, uh, very uh, heavy pollutants and increasing uh, climate change. So landfills are filling up on land, 
but also landfills are filling up in the ocean and in the ecosystem. And in a few slides uh, on, I'll show you a picture about uh, what the impact of our uh, waste disposal uh, basically habits is. And of course, greenhouse gases are increasing. Chemical and biological polluters are also affecting critical planetary systems. And we'll talk about that in a second. Next, please. So types of waste. So beyond the solid waste uh, types that we know from plastics to paper to metal to glass, we also have wastewater, which is generated as waste from our uh, municipal, industrial, and all sectors. Even the agricultural sector generates brine, uh, drainage uh, wastewater. We also have hazardous waste that's produced from batteries uh, to other types of waste. And we have biological and chemical waste. And we have, of course, the gases, which the most prominent, what we hear today uh, uh, a lot about, is the greenhouse gases that are accelerating climate change. Next, please. So around 10 years ago, uh, the concept of planetary boundaries was, was introduced. So what are planetary boundaries? We have identified nine planetary uh, systems that regulate the state of the Earth. And if any of those planetary systems fails, it can impact the other planetary system, and it actually can undermine our survival as a human species, but also the way that we survive. So within each planetary system, there is a safe operating space, which is the green space that you see on the right side of the uh, slide. And if you notice, we have other than outside the green safe, uh, safe operating space, we have the light orange space and we have the dark red space. So the light orange is the, uh, the state of uncertainty. So we've moved beyond the safe operating space We've entered into the emergency state, but we still don't know to what extent. But then we have the red operating space, which is we are really in a crisis mode and we're undermining that planetary system. And if we look at the different planetary boundaries, we will notice that the uh, biochemical flows, which basically are the phosphorus and the nitrogen cycle, which is very heavily affected by how uh, our agricultural production, agri-food system, are in a, a crisis and emergency state. And that can be observed in the different uh, marine environment, uh, in the dead zones that are increasing on a yearly basis. But then we also move to novel entities. And this is new materials. These are human-made materials that we have introduced into the environment. And from those novel entities, one of the most prominent uh, entities is the plastics. So we have we are using plastic across all of our uh, daily lives in everything, including into in our food system, as we'll talk later. And those plastics are uh, are ending up into the environment, and they are novel entities. They are not part of the environment, and uh, there are many issues associated with that. But there are other types of uh, novel entities that also relate to our food system, looking at GMOs, for instance, as one example. And then we have the other planetary boundary that we have also really entered into an emergency state, which is the biosphere integrity. And we're basically talking about the biodiversity. We're currently in what is described as the sixth mass extinction. The last, the fifth one occurred 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs went extinct. So we are currently in a really a crisis mode in terms of biodiversity. And a lot of that biodiversity is driven by our agri-food system. And then we have climate change and we have the land system uh, change, which are still in the zones of uncertainty, but moving steadily towards the crisis and emergency state if we really don't take care about that. Next, please. So what is a circular economy? We want to move from a linear economy towards a circular economy. What does that entail? So there are three guiding principles when we talk about circular economy. The first guiding principle is we want to eliminate waste and pollution. And how do we do that? We do that through mapping the current system and trying to redesign for circularity, to look how can we become more circular. And in a moment, we'll talk about how can we become more circular. 
The second principle is we want to circulate the materials and products that have been produced and that we're using and have extracted from the ecosystem as long as possible and keep them in use for the duration of the time that we can do that. And the third principle is regenerate. We don't only want to eliminate waste and pollution. We don't want only to circulate materials and products, but we also want to make sure that those materials that we have extracted from the natural environment and that we have produced are sourced from uh, places that have produced it in ways that improve local biodiversity, that improve local air quality, water quality. So we move beyond sustainability to what we call regenerative. Next, please. So this is the famous butterfly circularity butterfly diagram. And what it uh, basically shows is, it shows that we have two sides of waste streams. So we have on the blue side, first of all, the center side, the, the, the straight arrows at the center, this is what a linear economy would look like. We extract, we manufacture, we produce, and then we dispose of and going as uh, basically uh, waste. Now, a circular economy looks at what are our inorganic material, which are non-biodegradable uh, material, including metals, glass, and what, and then how can we collect that material? How can we share it and redistribute it? How can we prolong and maintain its use in our uh, economy, uh, redistribute it, remanufacture it, and recycle it? The recycling is really the last uh, step. And the purpose is to continuously maintain those material in use. And then we have the blue side of the butterfly, which is the organic. These are biodegradable materials that can be uh, recycled within the biological cycles. Of course, the uh, designing for circularity for the inorganic material really is different than how do we design for organic material. And we need to take this into consideration as we move and redesign our processes. Next, please. And with this slide, I wanted just to, to show the difference between the different economies. Many people mistakenly think that the recycling economy is a circular economy. And recycling economy is really a step uh, beyond a linear economy where we look at how can we recycle and use the material that we have produced, but there is still a large, a considerable amount of waste that is generated. A circular economy really lo looks beyond recycling. And as we'll see in a minute, recycling is actually one of the last steps in a circular economy. What we're looking at is how can we continuously reuse and repair before we really actually recycle. And the objective is, as I mentioned, to have a minimal if no waste at the end of the uh, cycle. Next, please. So this is what is called the 10 Rs of circularity. So if we look at what's the first priority when we're redesigning for a circular system, and the first priority is really we look at the products, we look at our manufacturing, and we look at how can we de decrease the, the use of raw materials and even reach to a place where we actually prevent new raw materials from being used, which is the refuse. After we do that, we are looking, we generated the material. This is in the production cycle. The, the second priority is how can we extend the lifespan of the products and the parts that we have produced? We can we do that by reusing. So secondhand using, we look that by maintaining material and products by repairing them. We look at reviving uh, products through refurbishments, for instance. And then how can we, what, whatever cannot be repaired or revived, how can we remanufacture it and produce a new product out of it? And then how can we repurpose it for another function? So this is the second priority. Now, once we exhaust all of our options for reuse, repair, revive, remanufacture, and repurpose, then we move to the priority, the third priority, which is what the useful application of the material, or here what we say, the useful application of the waste stream. And this is where we do recycling. So we look at what material we can salvage, which has a high possible return on investment and value. And then whatever is left, we look at incinerating it to recover the waste. Uh, to recover the energy from that waste. Next, please. 
So now we move to more focus more towards what is a circular food economy. And we start that with uh, next, please, introducing what is food. So when we talk about food, we're talking about any substance, be it processed, be it semi-processed or raw, that is intended for human consumption. And uh, this includes drink, it includes any substances that were used in the manufacturing, preparation of treatment of, uh, of food, but it does not include tobaccos or substances that are used as drugs or cosmetics. Next, please. And then if we're talking about a food system, I'm sure many of you have heard about the food system. What does a food system mean? So in a food system, we have, like most of us know, we have the food supply chain or the value chain, which is looking from the production, manufacturing, to storage, processing, packaging, retailing, and uh, producing food. We also have the food environment, which is the environment where uh, producers of food, this uh, provide their food and we as consumers go and consume that food. And this, the food supply chain and the food environment, they are affected by different external variables or drivers that drive and affect these uh, components of the food system, but that are also affected by these different components of the food system. And these drivers are on the, the top side, which we're looking at the environment and climate change. We're looking at globalization and trade. We're looking at income and distribution, urbanization or different demographics, population, politics, social, cultural. All of these factors really are affected by the food system, but they also affect the food system. Now, we move now then to the individual factors. We as consumers, we have our own uh, economic, uh, cognitive uh, values, spiritual and cultural values, our situation. And all of these affect us and our behaviors when we go to the food environment to procure, procure food and use food, but also to produce food. So all of these factors, they basically impact at the end, the, uh, they have environmental impacts, they impact our livelihood, we have nutritional and health, uh, health impacts as it affects our diets. So this, in a nutshell, is all of this is a food system. And the objective of showing you this diagram is to show you that really the food system is a complicated system. And it cannot be addressed when we're looking to move to, a sh to shift to a circular food economy. We really need to take all of this into consideration. Next, please. So if we're looking at the implications of the current food system, if you, uh, when I talked a while ago about the planetary boundaries, we saw we have exceeded a lot of the planetary boundaries. How does that tie to our food system? So our food system basically generates currently between 21 and 37 of the global greenhouse gases emitted on a global scale. 40% of the terrestrial land is actually used for agri-food production. And 25% of that land is degraded. We have soil degradation because of our food production. And the food system, the agri-food system, we use 70% of fresh water uses is actually going to produce our food. And 80% of the deforestation, which heavily affects biodiversity, is driven by uh, the agri-food system. So, which is the 70% of biodiversity loss. And with all of these implications of our food production, 40% of the food that we produce with the intention that this is food intended for human consumption is actually wasted or lost during the process. Next, please. So when we're looking at designing for a circular food economy, we have four pillars that we look at. So we, we're looking at food waste and how can we minimize it? We're looking at packaging. Packaging is very important for the food system, but how do we deal with that and how do we redesign it to be more circular? We look at sourcing of the ingredients that we use in our production. And the fourth is we're looking, of course, food is there to nourish us and to provide the nutritional uh, requirements of our uh, body. So whatever we design, be it linear or be it circular, at the end of the day, it has to be a healthy food system that, not, that nourishes us. And within all of the system, when we're looking to the approach that we want to look at is we need to measure, we need to understand and map what's the current status. 
Oh, and then we need to act. And of course, this all starts with targeting. So we target, we want to move to a circular economy, and then how do we map it and how do we start acting on it? Next, please. So food waste is the, the, the first and biggest problem. Food, this is waste. This is food that basically exited the food system because it's no longer suitable for human consumption or we don't want it. Next. And this food exits the food system along the entire value chain. Yes, please, next. So from production, next, please. From production to the consumption, there is food that is exiting the food system. Now, where that food exits the food system is defined whether it is food loss or whether it is food waste. And during our next webinar, we would be covering this in more detail. Next, please. So on a global scale, 40% of uh, the food that is, uh, is lost or wasted, and this food that exits the food system actually consumes 25% of that water that goes to the agricultural uh, sector, and it's cultivated on 28% of the cultivated land. And 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions is actually due to uh, food loss and waste. Next. So we have a global target on food loss and waste, which is target 12.3, and we will cover that more into our next webinar. But what I want to mention is that we do have a global index for food loss. We do have a global index for food waste, and both those indexes countries are required to report on in the coming years. Next. The second pillar is packaging. Packaging is very important to reduce food loss because packaging basically protects food from being uh, damaged. It uh, prevents tampering of the product. So it maintains, it promotes healthy and safety because it basically extends the shelf life and it also ensures the safety of the food. So it increases consumer base, it, but unfortunately, it has an environmental impact. And the most harmful uh, packaging is actually styrofoams and plastics. Next, please. So this is a picture we've seen, most of us have seen landfills, but this is actually what happens in the ocean from our landfill. This is called the Great Pacific Garbage Pack. It is uh, 1.6 million square kilometers. So it is three times the size of France. And this is basically generated from our usage. Um, not all of it, of course, we don't only use plastic for our agri-food system, but our agri-food system is a big plastic user. Next, please. So circular strategies uh, for businesses, we look at packaging elimination. We look at using sustainable packaging options and we look at material circulation. Now, uh, there is a lot of opportunity for uh, innovation in the packaging field. And what I want to highlight here is that packaging cannot be looked in separation of the system. So even if a packaging says it's recyclable or it's compostable or it's biodegradable, if it's not collected, if it's not segregated and properly collected, and destined to the facility where it needs to be recycled or uh, uh, industrially decomposed, then we really are not recycling. So that's why when we're looking at a circular economy, we need to really redesign the whole system. Next, please. So sourcing is the uh, third pillar. And in sourcing, we look at how do we source ingredients that are diverse and they were produced in a diverse manner. So they were not produced in industrial farming, but also we diversify the ingredients that we're consuming, which is better for our health. We're looking at sourcing material that have a lower impact. We're looking also to transform inedible food byproducts or food waste into ingredients that maintain it in the food system or maintain it in our economy, which is upcycling. And of course, the most important, uh, very important pillar is we source material that has been regeneratively produced. Next, please. And uh, this is uh, what I wanted to highlight in terms of diversity. We're currently, our diet really depends on very few crops. So three crops basically constitute 63% of an, our energy. What does that mean? That means that a lot of our production, agri-food production, is monoculture and trying to produce those crops 
So basically what we're doing is we're not producing in a regenerative uh, manner. So I think I have another five minutes, so I'll skim through the remaining few slides. Next, please. So the, four, the fourth pillar of the circular food economy is healthy and nutritious food. So as we're designing for a circular food system, so as we're designing on, uh, on it, we also need to always remember, be it in the food waste, be it in the packaging, be it in the sourcing, that we want at the end of the day to provide healthy and nutritious food to people that meets their daily energy and nutrient requirements. And so we never should forget our healthy food pyramid in that process. Next. And why is this important? Because if we're looking at the implication of our current uh, food system, currently 3 billion people cannot really afford a healthy diet. We have 8 828 million hungry people in the day, which have gone 24 hours without a meal and do not know where their next meal is coming from. And at the same time, we have 1.9 billion adults who are overweight, of which 670 million adults are obese. And of course, this has a lot of health implications in terms of non-communicable diseases. Next, please. So what are the benefits of a circular economy? So the benefits, we eliminate waste. By eliminating waste, we reduce uh, our waste management costs. Uh, we reduce our dependence on natural ecosystems. We save money. We create opportunities because there are new businesses that are generated by the circular economy. We support local uh, communities. We tackle climate change and we improve access to nutritious food. Next, please. So how circular are we today? So Today, the global economy is only 7.2% circular. And if we look at the last five years when, uh, from when this circularity gap report has started being produced, we're actually the circularity level is going down on a global basis. So what we need to do is pursue a systemic change in our production, in our consumption, and in our waste management. Next, please. But of course, there are fundamental barriers as we move towards a system, changing, transforming our whole economy, there are institutional barriers, there are organizational barriers, legal barriers, economic barriers, behavioral barriers, and technical barriers that we also need to map. As exactly as we're mapping the system, we need to map those barriers, understand them, and devise strategies and ways and means on how we can address them. Next, please. And in that, what we're aiming for is to create an enabling environment. We want to create the enabling policy and regulatory framework. We want to uh, create the enabling investment, finance, and funding environment to promote circularity. We also want to raise awareness and also develop the skill base that could actually shift the economy and transform it to a circular one. We also need to have public-private uh, platforms where we bring everyone on the table to be able to map and redesign together. And of course, the last one is we want to create new social norms. And the new social norms is that a linear economy is no longer accepted. Thank you very much. Thank you, Seta. <clears throat> very clear. Um oral presentation and very, very clear slides that I'm sure everyone's going to want to, to have a look at uh, more closely and uh, multiple times. Um, in the chat, we're getting people asking questions, but also offering examples of where uh, different kinds of packaging have been used or different approaches. So um, let's let's turn to a few of these questions um, and, and, and comments So that. Um, at least for this first round. So one, <clears throat> particularly focused on Africa, but you know, it's global as well. <clears throat> what are important knowledge gaps that we should be collectively focusing on, particularly in this space of circular food economies? You know, where where do we need to know more to be able to act, uh, as opposed to needing to act even if we know something? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I think every one of the pillars we need to, to know more in. So if we're looking at the food waste, one of the critical pillars that we don't have is we don't have me measurements. So we actually don't know where the food is exiting, why is it exiting, and how can we prevent it? So measurement mm -hmm. is very important in terms of food uh, loss and waste. In terms of packaging, what is important to know is First of all, to distinguish between the different types of packaging and mm -hmm. also to map the current uh, system that exists. So, for instance, we go uh, as uh, consumers, we buy uh, something in a plastic bottle that has the recycling uh, sign on it. But we live in a community where that uh, packaging is not collected, that plastic is not collected, mm -hmm. it's not properly segregated and then it's not recycled. So even if it has the recycling uh, bit on it, it's not recycled. Even now we have all of this compostable, for instance, packaging that is coming up, but compostable needs actually, uh, that, that relates to industrial composting. It's not a compostable plastic that we can put in our backyard and it would compost. So mm -hmm. we feel we go to these events and all of the utensils are compostable. So if those, if those if that packaging actually is collected and put with the recyclable packaging, the recyclable packaging becomes unrecyclable. So there's a lot of understanding mm -hmm. research that needs to come into that space as well. And a lot of innovation as well as we move more towards uh, packaging that comes from natural ingredients that are biodegradable. Yeah, if we're looking I... at sourcing as well, we need a lot of research on how things were produced. That's great. That's very specific. And and Francois, I think, was talking about banana uh, yeah. leaves and, and those kind of things. But I think what you point to is a, is a need for more transparency uh, in, in the terminology and in what we actually understand to be things like compostable. So Grant budding us a, a very important question, which is that you know a lot of packaging uh, is designed to prevent food loss and waste, or at least nutrient loss in, mm -hmm. in foods. Um, do we know much about that, the trade-off between, you know, if there's no packaging, there's more food loss and waste, but if there is packaging, there's more packaging waste. Right? Do, is that an area we need to focus more on? We, it's it's a definitely an area that focus is currently being put on. There's a lot of innovation happening in the space of packaging. We know that we can't actually let go of packaging because that not only increases our food uh, loss and waste, but it also compromises food safety. So if people consume unsafe food, it can lead to uh, foodborne diseases. And we don't want that. That's, that's a major issue other than waste as well. What we need to focus on, and I believe that provides a great opportunity for uh, SMEs, for uh, local employment is how can we mm -hmm. innovate our packaging to move to shift more into using right. plant-based uh, packaging material. And there is already a lot of innovation happening in that space. So in that, we're not going to only focus on packaging, but that's an important dimension. The other element of packaging is of course, food safety. Mm -hmm. And you know, do we know much about the more plant-based packaging? Uh, is it as protective? Of, of pathogens and enhancing mm -hmm. of food safety and is the food safety community engaged in this this complex dialogue yes yes and and we should always keep food safety at uh, you know center point Pat patrick even some of these you know uh, new packaging materials that are brought in like cardboard they are addressed or sprayed with certain material that we still don't know what are their uh, consequences on our human health. So there mm. is a fine line between moving from looking at packaging and looking at uh, food safety. So you mentioned um, very appropriately that uh, you know food systems are complex and there's mm -hmm. food loss and waste uh, along the entire food system. But obviously uh, we can't do everything at once. Um, so are there particular entry points into the food system or particular policies or incentives that we should be looking at as a, as a top priority in the sense to try and either nudge or, or generate a systemic change that you're, you're talking about? 
So I, I would, I, I personally believe that, you know, food waste is a low hanging fruit in mm -hmm. terms of looking at how can we redistribute excess food? How can we repurpose it for other uh, uses that maintain it in the food system? And, and that starts with measurement. And in the meantime, as we're addressing our food loss and waste, we work on our packaging and our sourcing because our packaging really still, we are still in early stages of innovation and product development and to ensure safety and for it to be disseminated wide scale. But then on the sourcing as well, to move to a more regenerative production, which uh, we're shifting more away from industrial monocultural farming to more more regenerative one, that would also take time. So it's it's more of a tier approach. And in my personal belief, food waste, uh, food loss and waste is the lowest and the easiest hanging fruit to, to start addressing. Mm -hmm. As we work, of course, on the other ones. Yeah, and so, and uh, yes, um, some questions, some people are, are question, asking really, you know, much of this is, is of global importance, uh, mm -hmm. but of course packaging is really post-farm uh, mm -hmm. value chain issues, you know, so what are the potential benefits to smallholder farmers and smallhold, you know, local marginal consumers? Uh, to thinking differently about you know circular economy i mean some of this is pierre andre mentioned some of this is about changing mindset it's changing behavior but yeah. then not just at the consumer but also at the producer end, and 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 include including smallholders so you know what what how do we encourage them to mm -hmm. be champions of this new agenda so I think for smallholder farmers, there's also big opportunities by minimizing their waste and their losses, because mm -hmm. the the whole uh, the whole notion of a circular economy is looking at what we currently deem as waste and look how can we reuse it in a more productive way and we maintain that we look at that as a resource. And I think Omar, who's our next uh, case study, would present how do we lose, uh, actually how do we, do we reuse organic waste for insect farming, but that's one repurposing. So mm -hmm. I think by, for smallholder farmers, if we can work on ways on how to repurpose what is currently waste and put it back into the system can actually provide new livelihoods, uh, save on costs and so on. Yeah, well, on that basis, mm -hmm. why don't we move over? Thank you for those uh, interesting mm -hmm. responses. Let's, let's hear now from uh, Omar Habouche. Um, with a more specific example of, of uh, where we can go in this uh, space. Omar has a different kind of background, uh, more than a decade in financial services work in London and Dubai. Uh, but he now start, uh, helps um, startups uh, in this space from conceptualization to commercialization of innovations. Um, he was head of uh, ESG, Environment, environment, social and governance actions at uh, Asarte Capital uh, Partners. He has a master's in finance from the London Business School. And at Hive Mind, where he is today, he's focused on finance strategy and operations as they relate to these uh, circular economy issues. So, Omar, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, just before I start, you know, we we understand that, for example, talking about black soldier flies is something maybe conceptually quite different for uh, for a lot of people. It's something quite new. So my purpose, you know, a little bit different from Sita's, you know, I'm going to talk about kind of the pros of a project of this sort and kind of each aspect of it in in, in its entirety. Um, next slide, please. So you know, as an executive summary. Um, you know, Hivemind is looking to build a black soldier fly facility in the United Arab Emirates, specifically in kind of Dubai, um, with the goal of leading to turn organic waste into a potential value stream, uh, which we have identified now and future value streams will be coming uh, across in the future. Those two value streams that we've identified already today would be organic fertilizer, which we know is in demand globally and a form of agri-protein or a sustainable nutritious protein that can be fed to livestock, aquaculture, and other forms. Uh, down the line, there are other 
more kind of innovative approaches of the uses. Um, it's a way of basically reducing waste. Um, as Sita mentioned, I'm sure we've all seen large scale landfills um, and provides a recovery in these with reducing greenhouse gases, tackling the global protein shortage. And more importantly than what we've seen recently is, for example, in COVID is supply chains, which can be strained between different governments, between different countries. And it's a form of basically strengthening these domestic supply chains to make you a bit more independent in times of emergency and need. Um, next slide, please. So um, very similar to kind of what Sita discussed, you know, we, we saw that the problem nowadays is a, is a linear economy of waste, which we use, we dispose, we waste and we pollute. Four of the main areas that we've seen um, that we are more targeting is a um, lack of, let's say, fertilizer, given the rising price of fertilizers globally um, due to conflict, due to supply chain strains and such forth. As an example, uh, organic fertilizers have risen from about $230 a ton just at the start of 2020 to about $430 per ton. And some forms of fertilizer can go even higher. And just to add to that, these are all chemical based fertilizers. Um, we understand that you know nearly one third of food waste annually is, is wasted or food is wasted annually with a predominantly two thirds or even more of that that actually ends up on the landfills itself, uh, taking up space and forming extra pollution. Um, another issue we, we noted is that with about 2.5 billion people not having access to adequate food, we need to start to kind of think and conceptualize a method or finding a way of providing valuable and nutritious protein to more people. Um, and then we identified and looked at the way that traditional livestock farming has been undertaken. Um, you know, sources say that traditional livestock uh, farming leads to about 15% of, of total global greenhouse gases and a large scale of the actual agricultural land use um, that we are seeing. Uh, so our solution, next slide, please. Again, keeping with the concept of the circular economy of waste is a black soldier fly facility is able to convert, to benefit and to recycle um, in a circular manner where we don't have to then worry as much about what is wasted because we are able to reuse that to produce more food in itself. Um, and uh, next slide, please, is something that I just put together to kind of give people a bit more of an overview as to kind of how something like this works, because people are often baffled by kind of the scale or um, the method. So when we started looking at this about a year ago, um, we were looking at a small scale facility, which is take, which would take about 25 tons of organic waste of input daily uh, to the facility. And the facility would be of our scale of about seven to 8,000 square meters, which sounds quite a lot, but is it much smaller than, let's say the total area or size of landfills globally. Through an eight to 10 day process, the black soldier flies go through a stages of um, between nursery and growth, and they are fed the organic waste that is being input from the landfills. And on the out, on the outputs, you get two valuable streams, as we, as we briefly mentioned. One is on a daily basis, you'll be able to generate between six to seven tons of organic fertilizer can be used for farming. And also note that this is completely organic with also higher efficacy in growth rates. And additionally, you're able to, to generate about two to three tons of dried larvae on a daily basis. This can be used, as we mentioned, to feed chickens, to feed uh, cows, to feed aquaculture, salmon, krill, shrimp, um, pet foods as well, very sustainable for pet foods. And it's quite a large market in the kind of, let's call it uh, pet food industry, especially for dogs and for cats. Um, and that's kind of our vision of what we're looking at on a high level basis. Um, next slide, please. So when you're thinking about this facility in its entirety, right, it's almost like having, um, you know, my initial thought when we started looking at this at Hivemind was, this would be just a bunch of guys and a bunch of nets and a bunch of boxes here and there and everything would be very manually processed and that there was no technology involved. However, the more digging we did and we partnered up with a black soldier fly consultant based in London who have been doing a feasib we've been working to do a feasibility study over the last year, you know, we came to the conclusion that actually there are 
quite a lot of technological, let's say, forward thinking advancements in this space that have helped make this a lot more efficient, a lot more cost effective. As an example, you have technology which is able to dose feed equally into uh, each crate that the so that the black soldier flies are are, are in. Um, you have, for example, something called a fly counter, which basically counts the number of individual black soldier flies that are being put into each process of the state or each stage of the process of the growth of the insect itself from baby larvae or neonate until basically it turns into an output. You have robotic arms with a conveyance system, which again helps with cost efficiency, the removal of human error or the requirement for as much need of labor as well, and allows you to scale the operation in a much larger size. And one of the most impressive technologies I've actually seen firsthand is something called the neonate counter. Now, when you dose black soldier flies into the crates to feed on the organic waste that you are inputting, you have to have a fine balance between the amount of waste you're putting in and the amount of neonate larvae or so the baby larvae, black soldier flies that you're putting into each crate. As an example, I went to see this neonate counter in London and you know when i tested it i dropped a handful of sand inside this counter and it could count every single individual grain of sand and that's important because each neonate or each baby of a larvae is probably the size of a grain of sand what that's important to do is it allows us to kind of be a bit, lot more cost effective a lot more efficient and get the quantities right to produce the highest level quality of outputs while also maximizing in well, while allowing us to kind of bring more input into it so what, what was interesting to us you know, over the last year is to see how far this industry has come and the level of technology that's, that's there. Uh, next slide, please. So you know, a few of you might ask yourself, you know, well, well what, what is a black soldier fly and why? You know, the black soldier fly has sustainable feed ingredients. It's a high uh, quality protein and fat. It has been already approved in many countries or many regions such as the EU, parts of Asia, and also now in the US. The Middle East is slightly behind on the regulation, but we understand in the Middle East, they kind of have a look and see approach where they see what other regions are doing. As we mentioned, high quality organic fertilizer, uh, completely odorless, higher efficacy, no added chemicals whatsoever. Um, the manure treatment and the greenhouse gases reduction is incredible. Um, these black soldier flies produce very, very minimal amounts of greenhouse gases to convert the inputs into feasible outputs. The cosmetic ingredients, you know, as we said, it's, it had, provides anti-inflammatory effects. It's clinically safe in animals, humans, uh, both alike. The bugs themselves are not capable of transmitting disease, given the, the structure of what they are, the skeleton and, and the nature of themselves. So unlike, for example, what we've seen in the past with many livestock, um, and you know it's much more sustainable food waste treatment than leaving it on a landfill. You, know, you get about 17 times less uh, methane emissions versus landfills. And again, we're seeing regulation kind of change towards that direction uh, for us. Just as an example on the right there, you can see a comparison of what you know the black soldier fly gases um, compared to other traditional livestock of producing a kilogram of protein. Um, the amount of land use is substantially less. The conversion ratio, so the required level of input required, is much less. And not just that, but the actual inputs for a black soldier fly is waste, whereas the inputs for other kind of livestock or, or livestock like chicken, pigs, and cows is actually crops and and required outputs. Um, and again, Asita mentioned, you know, we're, we're coming potentially across a water shortage or water crisis over the coming years, as a, as in as a society, and the required use of water to produce one kilogram of protein is also substantially less in, um, in that area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we first looked at this um, together, we had a number of different kind of, let's say, uh, insects, for lack of a better word, that we were trying to look at and which ones would make more sense. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, but you can see we compared the black soldier fly and performed trials between black soldier fly, mealworms, crickets, and grasshoppers, and on pretty much every every aspect of all, um, the black soldier fly comes on top, higher feeding efficiency, much faster growth rates, 
lower environmental impact, lower use of water. You know, they say it's about 10 times less water than mealworms and crickets, 10 times less land use than mealworm and crickets, higher nutritional values for, for animals, and also safer and higher nutritional values for humans as well. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned briefly in the beginning, you know, we've already, I already identified two very important uh, end products that can come out of a black soldier fly facility. One is the larvae themselves, which I mentioned that can be used for specialist pet food. Uh, they're rich in protein, fats, uh, in zoos, and other types of, of, uh, of pets as well. And the larger one that we're seeing kind of gather more traction is the use of aquaculture and livestock feed, uh, as you mentioned a couple of times, um, rather than using traditional crops per se. The frass, aka, which is also the call it the fertilizer that is one of the other outputs, is um, can be used for soil enhancement in gardens, hotels, malls, households, uh, farming, um, and requires less of a use of fertilizer. And also, again, as we mentioned, a higher efficacy in the growth rates for the crops themselves. You know, future, looking into the future, we're seeing studies, research, trials done into using um, the black soldier flies as outputs for um, biomedical applications. The chitosin, which is extracted from the skeleton of the black soldier fly, can be used to biomedical applications, wound dressings, drug delivery systems, tissue engineering, scaffolding, 3D printing as well for prosthetics. In the cosmetic space, due to its high nature in fats and, uh, sorry, in fats, it's used in moisturizers, sun, sunscreens, anti-aging properties, keeps the skin hydrated uh, and away from kind of sun's harmful rays. And that again is the chitosin that can be extracted from, from that. Um, and, you know, when we look at this, as we grow as in, in terms of this industry and more research comes about, you know, we believe we are still very early on and we've only been looking at the viability of two, let alone the additional ones that I've already mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Um, looking at the legislative side of this industry, um, we're seeing that they, it kind of varies from different region to different region. Um, the European Union allows quite a lot of it to be used for pet foods, fertilizers, livestock feeds. Um, the US is catching up there, the UK as well is catching up. When you get into kind of regions of Asia, you get a, you're allowed to kind of use it for all sorts. Now, What's more important than we've seen in the legislation of the use of the outputs is actually the required levels of the inputs. What I'm saying is they care, what people seem to be, or what the government seems to be looking to care more about is what are you feeding these insects rather than what is the output? And that's somewhere that a lot of work has to be done. Uh, here in the region in the UAE where I am based, um, there are no legislation currently active. They are currently underway. We've had discussions with the ministries who are looking at this for approvals. And again, the question therefore becomes not on, okay, what are the outputs, but what are you feeding the insects on the inside? Is it post-human contaminated waste? Is it pre-human contaminated waste? That is kind of where the conversations are drawing on right now. Uh, next slide, please. So the industry, you know, we know is, is growing at a phenomenal rate um, in the pet food, livestock and organic frass. Some figures there in terms of the levels of CAGR growth between now and call it, uh, that should be apologies, long term should be 2030, not 2023, apologies for that. But there's a high level of required volumes for all of those industries, and there is no way near enough supply to follow that. I traditionally come from a finance background, therefore, I believe that the money kind of follows where demand will come into this. We've seen an exponentially increasing level of funding uh, for various firms um, over the last few years. I think funding was about 50 million in 20, 2019 to about 100 to about 200. And I think total funding in 2022 and 2023 has reached about a billion dollars so far, um, so far this year. So as more and more money gets put into the industry from private equity, venture capitalists, high net worth individuals, governments and corporations, we will see not just the increase in the level of cost savings and scalability, but also on the importance of um, the drawing up of that legislation to follow such. Um, next slide, please. Here, um, 
Over the last year, we've been doing a feasibility. And as I mentioned, you know, we're looking to build a capacity that's about 25 tons a day of input. These, that is considered in the industry a, a relatively small scale facility with some facilities reaching about 400 tons of input a day. Um, we drew up the financials here locally with regards to the feed conversion ratio, which basically states we've gone to a landfill, we've taken the feed waste or the organic waste, we put that in to our testing, and we've understood at what conversion ratio that would happen, taking in the electricity cost, the gas and the water cost, which uh, currently is not subsidized, but might be subsidized in the future. Um, and at the current selling prices of what we see is whole dried larvae and frass, um, we see kind of a level of decent levels of margin of about 70 to 75%. Um, to build a facility, just to give you a, a viewpoint, to build a facility of 25 tons, you're looking at about 10 to 11, 10 to 11 million dollars worth of capex uh, required, with about a 1 million a year of opex for management, labor, running costs, and such forth. So, um, next slide, please. And that's that's it from from our side. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Lots of great uh, detail there. As one case study and we'll, case example, and we'll hear more uh, specific examples in subsequent um, webinars. Um, so, Omar, a couple of specific questions to you. One one essentially is about uh, you know circularity in in concept. Of the black soldier fly uh, works great, great from the food dimension, but what about the hardware infrastructure, the tech dimension? Yeah, to what so, extent can you make that circular as well? Yeah. So in in terms of the hardware, like when I've been speaking to our consultants, and you know we've been, as I said, working on this for about a year. Every every couple of weeks, we come across a new type of technology, a new type of hardware, a new type of capex item mm -hmm. that. Um, allows let's say you know one like two weeks ago was a something called a churner which our consultant said is a small capex item of three hundred thousand dollars but what that allows you to do is it allows you to kind of mix the inputs more granularly and more into a mush that is evenly distributed so that all of your batches going forward when you feed them to the insects you will be able to receive the same level of quality of the output that for example was a, an issue before where people were saying well one day you might have waste that is 70% protein and and veggies and fish market. The next day you might get one that's 50% from a bakery. So, you know, as we dig into this more and as more, as I said, as more money is coming into the space from various sources, whether it's governments or private side, we're seeing CapEx and technology improve um, to the extent that it allows us to kind of work in all these inconsistencies, whether it is a CapEx item to improve the level of input whether it is a solution to kind of reusing the water that is used uh, back into the facility, or one which is actually a little bit more, let's say, um, scary is the bugs themselves, the black saucer flies, they emit heat when they grow. We have found a way of basically using that heat emission that they, that they leave and capture that and use that rather than using electricity. Es essentially, we're using their own heat to kill them, which is a bit sadistic, I understand, but it's all ways of finding and fine tuning inconsistencies, these inefficiencies, and making this not just cost effective, but also safer. That's a great, yeah, very great example. Um, thanks for that. How about demand, right? So you, you talked about that le legislative potential barriers, but they're, they're, they're coming down. I saw that Italy last month proposed a bill to not, not allow insect flour. In, to, to be used in pizza and pasta. Uh, so again, this is a bit of the mindset shift that uh, relates to SETA as well. Um, yeah. So you, you know, even if you're talking about demand for fertilizer, how can we how can we amplify demand to to pull more supply? Essentially? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, what you said is quite interesting. I think that that consumer perception and that perception from the public is something that's quite important. You know, as you said, Italians probably do not want you know, black soldier fly insects to be used in any of their pizzas, given how traditionally, uh, how much they love their pizzas. But, you know, for us, it's, it's on the consumer perception part. And I think that is changing. And I think the same with everything that we've seen historically, you know, at first people hate it, 
but after a while they kind of understand the benefits that come out of it. Um, as we said that the regulation is focusing on what the input source is rather than what the output source is. Mm -hmm. I think we can all agree that, you know, an organic fertilizer that comes out that has no added chemicals that is um, generated from organic waste is far superior than any chemical fertilizer that we use that might wash up into rivers, into seas, pollute elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that, you know, and my strength is not on the research part, but, you know, working with our consultants over the last year and doing testing, we understand that, that the level of growth is much higher using black soldier fly fertilizer than regular fertilizers. So you get a higher yield output. I think it's about education. I think it's about showing the scientific data, educating the people and showing them. And, you know, the perception is always, oh, I don't eat bugs. But it's not necessarily about you eating the bugs. It's about feeding the animals that we love to eat, the bugs themselves, to allow us to kind of have a little bit of a longer runway to potentially what, what Sita described might be a catastrophe one day when we can't grow crops and we don't have fertilizers um, as such to kind of grow the things we love to kind of eat. Absolutely. I actually have a flock of chickens in the backyard. I feed them black soldier fly and then the chicken waste goes to my compost, which I use for growing veg, right? So I mean, yeah, for example, the other day I went to, I saw somebody was showing me the size of two eggs, one or a chicken mm -hmm. that was fed uh, regular chicken feed and one that was fed black soldier fly. And there was a considerable difference in the size of the eggs. Now I haven't tasted, the, I didn't get a chance to taste the eggs, but you know, that's a starting positive sign there that you might be able to get a higher yield. Absolutely. Well, yield and, and potentially taste uh, as well. I mean, yeah, chick yeah. Chickens love bar insects anyway, regardless. Right? Exactly. Um, the question then would be, though, you know, feeding insects to livestock, for example, you know, the protein source to livestock, uh, are, are people, uh, are consumers willing to buy a steak that, where the animal has been fed? Uh, insect I, I, you know, I've been thinking about this and I was quite, quite interested. I was thinking about this and I said, well, I think a consumer would most more likely rather consume a steak from a cow that was fed black soldier flies than having to switch over to a vegan or a kind of vegetarian mm -hmm. option through impossible foods or using corn as an example. And that's not me just hating on that, but that's me trying to understand the perception of people. They'll go, well, I'd rather have a steak that was fed by black soldier flies where maybe the taste is 95 to 99% there than eating something that isn't meat in the first place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's a good point. Um, you you presented some uh, details on startup cost, man, you know, uh, operation cost. What about the the final product cost or the fertilizer, for example, compared yeah. to traditional? Yeah. So in terms of the outputs, um, when we started looking at this, we noted that you know going to trade shows, speaking to people, um, we noted that, for example. You, the larvae itself, then that depends on how you, what level, what output, is it whole dried larvae? Do you crush it into a powder form? Do you dry it? Do you freeze it? There's numerous ways of the output, but in general, prices have been trending higher, whereas in average, it used to be about $2,000 a ton. You're now fetching between two point seven and $3,000 a ton, and sometimes higher if you have been able to kind of use the right inputs as well. So pre-human contaminated inputs, um, so we're seeing that in terms of the demand side, because demand drives, obviously, the supply side. Um, as an example, we received an offtake agreement from somebody who said, hey, we're looking to take about 5000 tons of you guys. And we went, well, that's three or four years of our total supply. We spoke to right. a Turkish chicken farmer who said the same thing. He said, look, let's start with a small trial of 500 tons and we can go from there. You know, we were like, well, 500 tons is what we look to make in a whole year or 270. Mm -hmm. So he's like, well, come back to us when you can produce 5,000 tons a year. And so we are seeing the demand there. Um, scaling this is a bit more difficult, and well, not, not difficult, but in terms of getting the approvals from governments, getting the legislation in place um, is a bit more on the difficult side, but that's what we're kind of working on at the minute. So, yeah, thanks, Omar. Stay, if, if you don't mind, and I'll call uh, Seta back in um if you if you can set up while you're typing answers in the q a uh, but just to see if you have any uh, additional comments based on this conversation so i i to be honest i was uh, responding to the questions i didn't hear the last observation no no not just the last one but are as as we're coming close to wrapping up are yeah. there um 
additional points you want to, to add to this issue of gen generating demand, changing mindset, uh, reducing costs, and so on? Well, yeah, I think that's, you know, a changing mindset uh, is, uh, lies as a, as a first pillar to really switching and transforming our food system. Uh, we, we know now that our current food system, our current consumption uh, patterns are not sustainable and we need to change it, but we are in our comfort zone. So to move from our comfort zones, it's, uh, it's moving everything and... Uh, yeah, so that starts with changing of mindsets. And then as we change mindsets, we change policies and regulations, we change the enabling environment. So it's like a domino effect. And do we have much evidence on the best the pro, best practice in change, changing mindset? It's being done in, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of changing mindsets required both encouragement of, you know, for cessation of tobacco, for example, requires mm -hmm. both legislation, so policy action, a price effect through taxation, mm -hmm. and a peer pressure mm -hmm. dimension. Um, is that the kind of approach we're, we're thinking about, a bundling of these uh, dimensions? So if we're, if we're looking at changing, like uh, from my experience in the on water demand management and on energy demand management, which we followed exactly what tobacco site uh, uh, programs did. So we looked at social marketing. So we look at social marketing downstream social marketing, which is changing the behaviors of consumers. And for that, we map both the barriers and incentives. So we look at the incentives for current behavior. And then we look at the barriers for switching to the new behavior and what could be the incentives. And accordingly, we devise the intervention strategies. So of course that doesn't that goes hand in hand with the policy. So we will have also upstream social marketing, which you are, it's basically advocacy to change mm -hmm. the regulatory uh, environment. Because if we're looking at the four main pillars of uh, changing social norms, we're looking at communication and behaviors of consumers, we're looking at good governance, we're looking at technologies, and then we're looking at economic incentives. Right. So we need to address all of these. Absolutely. So it's, a, it's a, an, another uh, multi Yes, multi-purpose bundling uh, yeah. concept, which is unfortunately, no, maybe not unfortunately, it's just the reality. To so affect mm -hmm. change requires action, multiple actions working together. Yeah. Um, Seta, do you want to give a plug? What, what are you going to cover in the next uh, webinar? Take yes, away. definitely. There were a lot of questions on food loss and waste. And during the next webinar, we would be talking, we would be digging deeper into food loss and waste. We will be identifying the differences between food loss, food waste, uh, what are the different measurement tools, the, the different protocols to measure it, why the importance of the target measure act approach. Then we would also be looking at the food loss and waste hierarchy. So we're looking at the valorization, starting with the prevention all the way down to landfills or waste to energy. So that gives us also, it will give us an insight where the insect feeds on uh, uh, breeding feeds into that valorization of food loss and waste. And of course, we would have also a session on uh, the protocol so that as countries want or institutions want to move towards measuring their food loss and waste, both the food loss index and the food waste index, which is FAO and UNEP, is based on the international protocol. So we'll cover that. And we'll also have a case study like we had today about one of the measurement tools. Excellent. Uh, I hope that piqued uh, interest uh, from participants. Um, we're almost about time. Omar, any? A final word? I mean, I would just, you know, push again, you know, if anybody on the call here is locally in the Middle Eastern region, that we should start looking at this in a more kind of advanced stages and replicating the legislation that we've seen already put into place in some of the other regions and try and follow that. Um, because, you know, I understand that, for example, here in the Middle East, we have one of the highest levels of uh, food waste per, per capita. And so I think it's, it's a region where we suffer from water scarcity, where um, we're, we're aligned or we kind of are dependent on external supply chains. And it's something we kind of need to fix here in, in this region locally in the Middle East. So for me, it's uh, that's kind of a, an area of focus. Great. Concrete. I want to thank you. Uh,
both Sita and Omar for very, very clear and compelling presentations and responses. Thank you to all participants um, who've been engaged here. I hope to, to see you again in the next webinar. And uh, please be safe and stay well. And thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.